Good morning, this is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. This is November the 8th, 2015. We are about 40 minutes into our program, and we've had some trouble recording, so I'm not going to go back, uh, because at the same time we have a live Bible study class, and I'm not going to do that to them. We are talking about the gifts of the Spirit, Actually, we're not leaving anything untaped because last week we pretty much covered the vocal gifts, which is the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, and the gift of prophecy. So now we're beginning with the power gifts. Uh, everything, Old Testament, New Testament, everything we accomplish in the Lord's service we accomplish it through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In the book that we're studying Sunday nights, one of those chapters that we'll get to in a couple months is called the faith chapter. We, Christians, not Jews, but Christians, are called children of Abraham. In fact, everybody considers himself to be a child of Abraham. Jews are the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Other Arabs are the offspring of Abraham and Sarah's maid, Hagar, who was an Egyptian. But Abraham being the father, that makes them Abraham's children. But because Abraham was a man of faith, he proved his faith in many, many ways. But the way in which he really proves his faith is when he takes his son Isaac up the mountain and is prepared to take his life. Nobody in the Old Testament times knew where he got this faith. How could Abraham, knowing that out of his son Isaac there would be so many children born as the number of stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the shore, how could he kill the son or sacrifice him if he does how is this son going to produce that many offspring that is faith nobody in the Old Testament knew where he got this faith but when we get to it in the book of Hebrews in that faith chapter we'll find out you know why he had so much faith because he believed in the resurrection. The resurrection, and I, I want to share something with you. I got an email yesterday from somebody who had commented on one of my videos. I don't know if it was last Easter or the Easter before. Uh, but there's a sermon that among good preachers, uh, is believed to be the greatest sermon on the resurrection ever preached. And Usually, if you give me enough time, I can find anything on the Internet. I could not find this sermon. 
but I found the outline that the preacher used. And so I think it's in the 125 videos that are under Preach with Parrots. I have some other accounts, but I think if you look under the 125 that are there, it's one of those. Somebody is offering to give me an original video of that sermon. Is somebody I don't know. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I, I, I told him to write prayer and praise. I, I just don't give out all my email addresses in a public forum. So I gave him prayer and praise, and, and I got a video from him saying that he will make a copy for himself, but he will send me this original, which you can't get. I'm going to suggest that he just send me a copy. The resurrection is the greatest doctrine in the Christian faith. Other people have died for friends, for brothers and sisters in the faith. But only Jesus was resurrected. The resurrection is the most powerful doctrine there is. Remember the rules for becoming an apostle? You had to have seen Christ after his resurrection. Uh, that's in the first two chapters of Acts when they're uh, electing somebody to take Judas's place. The resurrection is the most powerful thing that has ever happened. It's, it's Christ's death and sacrifice for us is tremendous. But it would have no effect, no value if it were not for the resurrection. And I will find a way to share this with you. Maybe the way I shared some things today before this message. Um, I won't send it beyond just my Bible study. It will go beyond that because I'm not sure it would be appropriate but I will share it with you. The greatest sermon on the resurrection that anybody has ever preached. All right. Faith, healing, and miracles. Without faith, you can't do anything. Everything. Old Testament was believing it counted for something. You brought the sacrifice. You kept the feast days. You did all the things you were required to do. And you had faith that by doing that you were pleasing God. Now salvation is by faith. By faith you accept the fact that if you confess your sins and you repent of them, which means you're really sorry for them. I, I'm amazed sometimes at kids that go to confession. When I was growing up, uh, and it was during the war, there was a priest that pastored a church on the 12 mile road and we lived on the 13 mile road. So it was about a mile away. He was very well known. He had a radio program. Um, and he uh, talked about faith you have to believe I used to wonder where this priest grew up because they used to have confession on Saturday mornings. And Mass 
It was Sunday morning. Did this priest not figure out what the kids were doing between Saturday morning and Sunday morning on Saturday night? <laughs> there was no repentance there. There was no sorrow. They just went through the, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been so many days since my last confession, and this is what I did. And the priest says, all right, if you're an adult, so much in the poor box, or so many Hail Marys, and so many Our Fathers, and I never saw that anybody was really sorry for their sin, but this is part of salvation. And if you truly are sorry for your sin, and you truly believe that you can be saved by confessing your sin to Jesus, that's faith. Not anything you can see, not anything you can reach out and grab, but it's faith. So miracles and healings require faith. And just like tongues were necessary if you're going to interpret them, because you can't interpret nothing, so faith is necessary if you're going to believe God for either healing or a miracle. Now, what's the difference between healing and a miracle? A miracle is the suspension of God's law. There's the law of gravity. I drop this. You don't know what's going to happen, right? It's going to go down. There's no way when I turn loose of it, it's going to go up. It goes down. The law of gravity. There's another one of God's laws. Something that's moving is going to keep moving till something stops it. It's not going to slow up and stop on its own. If you push a ball down the floor, that ball eventually starts slowing up. But it's only slowing up because there are other forces working on it. Either you've got a floor that's not perfectly smooth, or you've got wind. There is something that causes something that's moving to stop, or it would continue moving forever. Once it's moving, it's going to keep moving until something stops it. And once it's stopped, it's going to stay stopped until somebody pushes it and makes it move. That's one of the laws. Now, when you change one of those laws, you have a miracle. The power and ability to do things like that come from basically two, but sometimes three sources. God has the power to take a person that has, let's say, a tumor and make that tumor disappear. not going inside with surgery and taking it out, just making it disappear. And there are miracles. There aren't as many miracles as people on television would like to make us think. But there are miracles. God does do miracles. When the natural laws are suspended, that is a miracle. A miracle, when laws are, someone has the power to suspend natural laws like God, then the power comes from God. 
we know that some demons have power. Not as much power as God, but there are demons with power. And they can make things happen. And then there are people who are extraordinary. So I'm kind of adding that third one. It's not the same kind of power, but uh, I wanted to cover everything. So it takes faith. And it takes supernatural power. Supernatural power is beyond our natural power. I don't have the power to make a tumor disappear. I don't have the power to do it. so. If I had the power, it would be natural. Since I don't have it, it is supernatural or beyond natural. That accounts for a miracle. Well, I'm going to come back to miracle, but let me talk for a minute now about healing. When a miracle happens, I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions to the rule. And I can't think of any, but I'm not going to say they don't exist. I'm going to say usually a miracle is total, complete, done, it's over with. Healing means getting better. If somebody has a condition that is causing them to be sick, They might receive a miracle. Let's say they have a liver that's not working, it's eaten up, or something's the matter with it. And God puts another liver in them. That would be a miracle. But just like sometimes taking medicine or eating certain foods cause things in our body to change, that liver through medicine or through food or through a change in your own emotions, because sometimes our emotions are so messed up that they cause us to be sick. And a person begins to improve and improves and improves and improves until they're better. So a healing is the beginning of a process by which you get better. You might pray for healing and the person who prays for you might say, you're healed and you say but I still hurt or I still can't walk or I still can't talk or in my case I still couldn't hear by the way I didn't tell you all because I haven't seen you you know that I was at the doctor Wednesday and he's been seeing me every three weeks he's been pouring stuff into the ear which he had to recreate in there he had to restructure it and I didn't have my hearing back and um, he gave me another one of those treatments Wednesday, and Wednesday night we had a Bible study. But Thursday morning, somebody sent me on this new phone an email that had, um, um, if you click on it, uh, it had a link on it. And I clicked on the link. And it started to play. But since this was new, I didn't know where the speaker was. And I'm looking all over. And uh, all of a sudden, I find a speaker down here on the bottom. But by this time, I'm trying to look at it and listen to it. 
And I realized when I'm doing this that this ear is hearing out of this speaker. And I thought, wow, I haven't heard out of that ear for five months. And uh, so I stopped my good ear and I could hear this about 50%. I could hear the television about 20, 30% on the other side of the room. So my surgeon has been telling me that it tests good. It tests like the power to hear is there. It just hasn't hadn't healed around it enough. And um, I'll have to call them because I won't see them again for a month. I'll have to call them and let them know that the hearing is coming back. But that would be a healing. Um, where there is a, a, a problem and it starts to improve. Now if all of a sudden hearing in both ears were perfect, that would be a miracle. Because this one doesn't have complete hearing anyway. And if all of this came back immediately and the rest of this one was, that would be a miracle. But what is happening is that it's healing. Now, this is not a miraculous healing. This is not a faith healing. The doctor did surgery. Uh, he put medicine in there. So I would not want to be foolish and say, God did it all. No. Doctor help. I helped a whole lot. Medicine help. My attitude and so forth helps. But that's basically the difference between miracles and healing. So if you have a miracle, whatever the problem was doesn't exist. And you have an immediate result. There is something else that preachers call a restored, restorative healing where this is a strange statement. It doesn't really make sense, but it's the best I can do right now. When you have something that goes beyond healing, Um, let's say that when the doctor went in they had to cut out a piece of bone and then he had to take a tumor out of there and then he had to clean up in there and blow everything out I guess they blow it out I don't know put the piece he took out back in there and kept it in there with glue now if he had taken out, and I saw a video the other day that explained it a little bit better. Uh, this other preacher was explaining it. Uh, somebody asked for prayer and didn't give any details, just said, pray for my inner ear. And of course, my ears perked up. Uh, didn't say what it was so he said he was healed and he told the minister that prayed for him that he was healed and the minister that prayed for him said well how do you know you're healed and he said well because I went to the doctor and I got an inner ear and I didn't have an inner ear before <laughs> that's a restorative miracle not something that was sick that has improved, but something that wasn't there. A bone that has been taken out, or a joint, or a leg that's been cut off, or a toe that's been cut off, and all of a sudden it's there. That's a restorative healing. I have seen the gift of faith enter into something when you know and 
and some uh, old-fashioned people say, when you know in your knower <laughs> the thing inside of you that makes you sure you know something, like you're sure you're in love, or you're sure you counted the money in your pocket and you had so much, you're absolutely sure of something, When you are absolutely sure that God has done something or is doing something, and there's no doubt, I mean, you'd have to be out of your mind to not occasionally have doubt. I don't know of anybody that prays for people that has 100% success. The apostles didn't. The disciples didn't. Um, so there's we have to always in our minds know that there's a possibility that there will be no miracle that there will be no healing but when you know and there's no doubt that is the gift of faith um I'm going to explain that a little bit more when we get into the uh, gifts of knowledge. I'll come back and explain faith again. But that's the gift of miracles, the gift of faith, and the gift of healing. There's a lot of similarity just like there's similarity between tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. It's all done with the mouth. Um, there are many, many uses of the gift that are similar, but there are differences. So faith, healing, and miracles, there are similarities, but there are differences. So now let's go to the gifts of knowledge. They are gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't learn them. You can't buy them. The guy in the book of Acts tried to buy them. He had been a sorcerer before he was converted, before he was saved. So he knew that there are powers. And when he saw the disciples pray for people to receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they did, he thought, hot dog, I'd like to have that gift. <laughs> so he offered the disciples money. Hi, Raven. And the disciples told them, your money perish, die with you. <laughs> None of these things can happen without the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not an illusion that you can perfect like a magician that you get everybody looking over here and something real quick happens. It's, it's Without the Holy Spirit, these things don't happen. In the knowledge gifts, they amaze me. You know that I'm not keen on talking about some of the personal experiences I myself have had with the Lord. I, to me, it's sort of personal. And there are things in our life that most of us like to keep personal. Sometimes it's our finances we don't think are anybody's business. Uh, sometimes uh, it's our personal family life. But 
when you talk about it too much, and there are some subjects that you can't some, shut some people up on, when you talk about some things that are special in your life too much, they lose their specialness. So I had not shared for years about having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in such an unusual way. I just, it's, it's personal. And um, uh, I just um, wanted to keep it that way. But if by sharing we can teach somebody, or if by sharing we can help somebody, then that's a consideration too. I shared with you in the past about an occasion in Salt Lake City in the gift of knowledge. I was praying and studying for a message one time when a it, it, it's even difficult to find words to express this. Uh, there is somebody who does it very well. He says, I was made to know. Suddenly I knew some things about somebody. Um, there is no way that I could guess <laughs> and be right on details. How could I, a stranger in the city, uh, you know how I hate contrived things. You know how I dislike it when somebody says, um, what does um, 3372946 mean to you? And the person says, oh, that's my phone number. See, God gave it to me. Probably it fell out of your purse or it's in your cell phone or who knows. Uh, I don't see that as being something God would tell somebody he wants to use to bless you. But God does sometimes give people information. Like I said, I just think people's addresses and people's phone numbers are not proof that God is on the scene working. I wouldn't say anything to them, but uh, I'd probably figure out how they did it. Um, and there have been people that have, I told you how that works and how they fake that. And then there was another night, several nights later, because revivals used to be for two or three weeks. Now they're three days. Um, that church was a Spanish-speaking church, and they had invited three congregations that spoke English and asked if I would speak that night and preach in English, which was hard for me to do, because if, uh, if you don't, do it very often. Words don't flow that fast. The Bible has words in it you don't use in everyday conversation and got to think a little harder. And I told you how I didn't feel that I had the right message for that night and it got closer and closer and closer and closer to the time to speak. And we had the congregation, plus we had three other congregations there. But I am a believer. You have to be honest with people. So I was prepared to say, I don't know why I'm here and I don't know what I'm going to say, but we'll see what's going to happen. But when I got ready to explain the situation, I was made to know that 
the information I'd received a few days ago, I should give. And I did, and of course, made perfect sense. It was about one of the people visiting from an English congregation. And of course, if I had given it the night the, I learned about it, that person wouldn't have been there. And this person was so taken aback that somebody could tell them what they'd been doing for the last few days and who they'd been doing it with, that it just blew them away. And they just crawled to the altar. Uh, that's the gift of knowledge. Knowing something that there is no possible way you could know it. That's the gift of knowledge. Now, what about the gift of faith works with the gift of knowledge and you know you got it right. If you're in love, you can explain it. You don't understand it, but you know for sure you're in love. Um, and it's like that with the gift of knowledge. I'm going to tell you an experience I had in the last five or six years. But this was the opposite. This was not me ministering to somebody else. This was somebody else ministering to me. And when God's doing something you don't say <laughs> anybody could get the phone number out of your purse or your cell phone. When God does something, there's no question that God did it. They're just like, no way it could be any other way. After I had cancer, uh, my surgeon said he got it all. There are little things uh, in the body that they surround surgical sites and organs and so forth. And let's say you have 30 or 40 of them in your stomach. There's no way to take three or four and know the condition of those that are left. It's impossible. They take three or four and test them because it gives them a pretty good idea, but the only for sure way is to test, take everyone out and test it. And that's not practical. And I'm talking about lymph nodes. So normally what they do is give you chemo anyway, a little, just in case, they say, to be on the safe side. Well, they don't tell you this at the beginning. And you can't start taking chemo right after your surgery anyway because you can't have any open sores. Uh, your blood must be at a certain level. So you couldn't start taking it right away anyway. So then pretty soon they start telling you, well, you really need to take chemo. I was not keen on the idea, but I didn't want to be considered a troublemaker. And I thought, okay, 
Do you want to give me a little chemo? Give me a little chemo. Well, pretty soon, they were giving me a high-powered $500 a shot thing. Oh, they wanted to. And I didn't feel comfortable about it. I'm not saying God told me no. I'm just telling you, I didn't feel right about it. And I was supposed to be getting my income tax stuff to them so that they could... Obviously, I didn't have $500 every other week. And somebody was going to foot the bill. I don't know who. And they kept calling. Why didn't I turn papers in? And I didn't feel right about it. So they called me one time and I said, is there anybody there I can talk to? They said, well, what about the scientist? I said, sure. Bring them on. <laughs> and uh, I said, all right, let me follow the logic. According to you, this invention of yours or discovery of yours does this, 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 and this because of this, 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 and then that results in this, this, this. Uh, I said, am I in the ballpark? And she said, man, you hit a home run. I said, well, in that case, it doesn't make sense. They were selling a product. They were not curing my cancer. And I said, no. And my doctor said, ooh, I'm scared because something will happen to you and people will say I didn't give you the right treatment and you died on me. I said, don't worry about it. I'll write a letter and take all the responsibility. You put the letter in your file. Don't worry. But they were still giving me a very small amount of chemo. But chemo is poison. Now, if poison will save your life, so be it. But it was making mine pretty miserable. And I was in the hospital with more junk than what the cancer had been because of the chemo. And I felt I should stop taking the chemo. Well, one of the times I was in the hospital with 40 different things wrong with me on eight different antibiotics and all this stuff. And I said, no, I'm through. But I said, test me. Instead of just giving me stuff, prove to me that I need it. And so they did a PET scan. In a PET scan, you drink um, stuff. Uh, it's nuclear stuff. And after 45 minutes, they scan you. Wherever you have cancer, it's like an x-ray with a light on it, like a Christmas tree. Well, my thing was totally black. There wasn't one light on it. I not only didn't need this $500 thing, I didn't need the little stuff I was getting, and it was causing me all kinds of grief. Right along in the middle of that, just before I quit, Uh, I was sick. I was at home. I was watching the 700 Club, which I don't watch all the time. I don't even think I watch it once a week. I might look at it, portion of a program once a week, or once every two weeks. I have no contact, no 
business with them. Uh, I don't send them money. I don't send them mail. They don't send me anything. I just watch them once in a while. Two people had a word of knowledge. This, the way it happened, it was so unusual that nobody could have messed it up that bad <laughs> if they'd been planning something fake. I've never been a preacher that says, I'm going to pray for you, put your hand on what hurts, and you put your hand on your elbow or whatever. But other people do, and that's fine. If that's what they feel, that's what they feel. I never felt that. So I sort of have a certain built-in resentment, but I do think if you're going to ask people to pray for you, you ought to cooperate with them. So there was one of the women and then, of course, there's the elder uh, gentleman and then his son. His son was on that particular day. And his son said, put your hand where you have that. Well, I was having trouble with both knees. And I was just being a smart aleck. I really was just being a smart aleck. And I took my hand and I put one hand on two knees, which is almost impossible. And um, I, I, I don't remember. I, I finally got a videotape of it. And it's in a computer that's crashed and sitting around the house here somewhere. Um, but I haven't seen it for about five years. And I don't remember all the details. But he said a number of things, and he was right on. I mean, he said... Somebody's touching both knees with one hand. <laughs> when you realize that the 700 Club does not own the stations that it plays on, but it plays on various ones, and the same program plays on all of them the same day at different times on different stations. So the likelihood of my watching it <laughs> at the right time is strange. And then my doing stupid things, just because that was my attitude that day. Um, was very unlikely. And then She had a word of knowledge. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of knowledge. She had a word of knowledge, and she's describing the compression stockings I was wearing and uh, some other stuff. They thought they were talking about two different people. And they were both talking about the same person at this one right after the other. The likelihood of them making that kind of mistake, but it, it is very unlikely. And so I arranged to get a copy of it because, boy, it all happened real fast, and I'm like, you got to be kidding. And um, so I arranged to get a copy of that program. And it's even more amazing. That is the gift of knowledge, knowing something that it's impossible. I've given you an example when I was given knowledge about another person. And I've given you an example when somebody else was given a word of knowledge about me. These things don't happen every day. They don't happen every week. 
they don't happen every month. They don't happen every year. If they did, you'd have to wonder about them. Just like with the gift of miracles, ain't no way it could happen. No way it could happen. No way the information is in a computer. No way that it just no way. Just like with miracles, there is no way it could happen. These um, uh, laws of nature are suspended. You drop something and it goes up instead of going down, the law of nature has been suspended. So, there is no way the gift of knowledge, the two incidences that I've given you that I know of personally, there's no way that they're fake. But there's no way that they're commonplace either. Knowledge is knowing something. There is absolutely no way you could need know it. Absolutely no way that they make those videos early in the morning or the night before, or whatever. They're, those programs are not live. So what those two people could see was long before I ever did it, ever tuned in, and with no contact. Now, even if I didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and I tried to figure out how anybody could, you know, fake it up, I can't. There's just no way. I know people that have done things, that have faked things and been caught, and I've told you about some of those. Can't be done anymore because they were using a kind of equipment that they no longer make that that uh, you could pull a few things with and, and, and that equipment is no longer exists and so you, you couldn't do it. And um, some of these things like telling you your phone number or your address, it, that's totally stupid. Why would God resort to something like that? But remember what I told you when we first started studying this? The fact that you got a copy is proof you got an original. It's like when royalty gets married and they keep their wedding dress a secret and different dressmakers they'll make most of, not complete account, but make most of it. One fitted, one loose, one this way, another, and then when they see the real thing, they take the one that's the closest to it. The fact that you've got a copy means you have an original. And the very fact that there are people trying to bring in something that isn't real is almost proof that the real thing exists. So I've seen in my 84 years real work of God. I've seen people pretend. I've seen people pray for other people and nothing happened and they said, oh well, you lacked faith. Hey, 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 hey wait a minute. Don't blame somebody else's lack of faith if nothing happens. Don't even go there. Wisdom is knowing what to do with the information you've got. 
in other words making the right decision there's one other gift that we haven't mentioned and that's discernment of spirits I told you early on God has tremendous power there are other sources of power like I told you in the book of Acts the man who had been a sorcerer and had done things through evil spirit becomes a believer sees the disciples Peter and John praying for somebody to receive the Holy Spirit and they do and he says oh I'd like to do that and offers them money so he knows that it is possible to do things through a power which is not your own because he has done it through sorcery now you and I know there's all kinds of fake fortune tellers and in a way they're not fake some of them are very good at reading people very good at getting information out of people and people just talk 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 and don't realize they're releasing a lot of information and a real smart person with a lot of experience can put things together I'm not talking about that wisdom is knowing what to do once you've got the information I have some information that I have to make a decision on and um, I didn't get the information through any spiritual Holy Spirit working but it's probably going to take a gift for me to make a decision so wisdom is knowing what to do with the information you have and the discernment of spirits is knowing if something has been done through the power of God that makes it supernatural something you and I can't do or if it's been done through the power of our adversary that makes it supernatural also something you and I can't do so knowing what to do in certain circumstances and knowing the source of the ability of something that's being done is one of the gifts so we have the nine gifts the vocal gifts tongues interpretation prophecy they call them vocal because they're they'll have are spoken we have the power gifts faith healing miracles and then we have the knowledge gifts discernment of spirits knowing something you could not know any other way and what's left discernment knowledge and wisdom those are the nine gifts um, there's something that I was surprised at the churches that are doing it I mean I expected something better from some of these churches that I've known for years but 
they're putting out something called a test to identify your gifts. Now this is fine. What they're doing is okay. Don't call it spiritual gifts. Call it something else. <laughs> I took one of those tests to see what it was like. You know, it's like an IQ test, one of those things. Um, do you enjoy helping other people? Uh, do you like giving money to people who need it? Uh, do people usually come to you for advice? Um, it's speaking of gifts like being a gifted piano player or being a gifted singer or being like um, some of the churches call mother so-and-so and, and elderly, especially in the black churches and in the Catholic churches. Um, an elderly woman who is very wise and people come to and get good answers. Those are gifts, but we're not talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We're not talking about a wisdom that just all of a sudden somebody has this information. No, we're talking about somebody with a lifetime of experiences that is very, very wise. And they call them, well, we want to, in some cases you can take them on the internet and then they'll even hook you up with the church that needs somebody that's got your gifts. Well, those are not the gifts of the Spirit. They're, they're gifts if the person is gifted. But the whole purpose is different. Those are more like supplying a need. Hooking a person up with a job that needs to be done and somebody that knows how to do that job that's looking for work. That's the kind of thing that is. There's nothing wrong with it, except I sort of don't like the idea that they call it a spiritual gift test. Um, next week, I will finish up by mentioning other things the Bible says about these gifts other than in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. Um, they did make provision for investigating or checking up and making sure that everything was on the up and up. And of course, any time there's an opportunity for somebody to fool other people or whatever, somebody's going to do it. Um, and there are in the Bible various scriptures and I'll have them ready for next Sunday and then we'll be off that subject. I don't know the next subject. If you all have a question, if you all have something you are wondering about that I haven't already covered uh, in, and it's already on on YouTube, um, let me know, and, and I'm always happy to uh, consider, since I decided to do various things on Sunday morning, I'm open and I'm a little bit more free. Sunday night is still through the Bible New Testament. Wednesday night is still through the Bible Old Testament. Let me turn off our video, and I'll be back with my live group in just a second.